Salam alaikum. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Or as they say in Swahili, uh, uh, Habari, how are you? Good? Or Jambo, let's go. Now, if, if you haven't been to Africa yet, it is one of the great experiences in your life. They say for international people, your life is marked before or after you first experience Africa. And of course, it's such a vast continent that uh, it reminds me of the of the old story of the blind men trying to describe the elephant. There's so many places, so many people, so many cultures, and we're just going to touch on the vastness of it on our uh, experience here on the Indian Ocean side in East Africa. I first came when I was working with Lindblad Travel. We used to have wing safaris out from Nairobi out to Tiger Tops and other um, safari camps. And then I've since come back by ship to the, the beautiful coast where we are. And so I'm going to kind of squeeze together a fast view of Kenya, Tanzania, and Zanzibar for you. Uh, and it is a, a particularly beautiful coast uh, and just a little part of the great continent, of course. Kenya in the blue there, but uh, Africa is truly immense. Uh, uh, perhaps Phil Perst, who is the real specialist in many of these countries, will show you a a map that shows all of North America, all of Europe, and most of Asia could fit into the African landmass. So what part we know of it is only just a bare fraction of it. And here we are coming to, into Kenya to Mombasa, but even Kenya is a vast country, larger, much larger than Western Europe. Uh, and so we'll only be in the coastline and then up to a few of the different reserves uh, from the city of Mombasa, which is the major port of East Africa. And this is a famous city in history just because it's had many rulers and many people have contested for it, but uh, it is at peace now and uh, the country generally is in, at peace, though uh, history goes on. Of course, you know that the first uh, human remains have been found in Kenya and, and Tanzania in the Great Rift Valley. This is the uh, Turkana boy who dates back about 1.6 million people and showed the first signs of, of the development of Homo sapiens, whoever we are. And uh, then they keep finding older and older uh, varieties of uh, uh, hominids and pr primates. You can look into that uh, on your own. There's a vast world of research that's being done right here in Kenya today. Uh, this in one of the museums in Nairobi, right? Nairobi is one of the flint tools that they've discovered over um, in the western portions of Kenya in the Great Rift Valley. And it was called the Swiss Army knife, uh, knife of the Stone Age because it could both grind, scrape, and cut. And maybe you'll find one for your uh, souvenir collection. But uh, the uh, tide of humanity has come through, particularly down the coast, and brought Arabs, Indians, Chinese. You can see some Chinese wear. This is just a sample of the of the depth of history that has come by here. The first re recorded settlement in, in Mombasa and down the coast are actually Persians from what is now Iran, the Shirazi traders who came all the way down here to set up trading posts. Now this is a, uh, a map that was drawn to try to describe the land here where we are going before it became European colonies. So you have in, right in the area uh, near uh, Zanzibar and Mombasa, the uplands, and you can see there there's a whole valley, or rather the mountains of the moon, which are this uh, series of mountains that sort of cut the interior off from the coastline. And to this day, the Swahili coast, where we are sailing, is a part different from all of the upland mountains and plains and uh, the deep interior. And th they had some trade back and forth, but this was never a, a unified land going back into prehistory. It was a a coastline plus many people who lived in many ways in the, in the far interior. Now when the age of European incursion came, first the Portuguese and then the Omani took over the coastal uh, ports of this area, then later, in, starting in the mid 1700s, 1800s, uh, it became British East Africa and then on the south side, what is now Tanzania, became German East Africa. And in the famous African conference in Berlin in 1889, the lines were drawn which remain to this day in spite of all of the local peoples and the, even the uh, geolo uh, geography of the area. But the main 
modernizing force that happened in Kenya was the construction of the Uganda Railroad from Mombasa up over the mountains and through the Great Valleys to Lake Victoria and into the deep inland and all the lakes that are in the center of this area of Africa. Now this has been called the, um, the Iron Snake because of course the Africans had never seen such a contraption and it's still operating today and, and if you have uh, interest as a train buff, you can take it all the way up to Nairobi and up to Lake Victoria. It hasn't been improved much since the 1890s though. And then it, then it opened up the interior for explorers, plantations, uh, commerce, and then it, it, it brought in all of these upland peoples into contact with uh, the world. And here's the major group of Kenyans, the Kikuyu, who are over 27% of the population. Now this is a woman in ceremonial dress, and curiously, they, they, they like to get rid of their tan this way when they get dressed up. Then there's other peoples. There are more than a dozen major groups of the Turkana, who are up in the northwest uh, mountains of Kenya. Then the uh, Maasai, you may have heard of seeing, they're very, very tall and, and men that are carrying weapons, spears, and bludgeons, and they are famous for resisting incursions into their area. Uh, the men uh, dress themselves up with ochre on their skin and are famously herd cattle and fight over cattle, and then one of their main sources of nutrition is drinking the blood of the cattle mixed with um, ash and other ingredients to uh, keep up their strength and health. Uh, they're down near the Tanzania border in the great Maasai Ma Mavo uh, region. Then there's the Samburu who are up on the border with Somalia that where it's very dry and they have camels for commerce. But most of these are generally called as part of the Bantu people who came over from Central Africa and then came into Kenyan areas and settled different lands. And so this is one of the subsets of Samuku Bantu. The Bantu people go all the way down to South Africa as a general classification of all these different peoples who have different customs and different languages. But uh, we will meet many. And uh, they're not so much on the coast. Those of you who are going on excursions inland will see more of the Bantu culture and the different uh, varieties, of, particularly the Kikuyu. Uh, what happened when the British came in and the Germans uh, was that they settled into some of the best farmland and drove the local people off. Um, famously, they charged a hut tax so that everybody, if they couldn't pay a cash tax, had to work as labor on the plantations. I happened to have a friend who was born and raised in Kenya on one of the, the great estates, and he grew up as an African. He was very proud that he had African friends like this illustration of a young lad, but when the rebellions happened, the Mau Mau rebellion in particular in 1950s, he had to leave, and then he became, I uh, couldn't, he had Kenyan citizenship, but he ended up being a citizen of the world, though he always wanted to come back and live in Kenya. Uh, the troubles of the development of Africa are extensive, and again, Philip Hurst has a brilliant presentations about this as we go along. I'm going to just describe very briefly that when World War I and then World War II happened, the the German East Africa, British East Africa tried to make a peace so they wouldn't get dragged into the war, World War I, but it ensued in a battles that led to the mobilization of the African Corps, the Knights, uh, the, or rather the King's Africans, riflemen and others. A few hundred thousand Africans joined in World War I and World War II, but this then led back to Kenya, Tanzania, to leaders who objected to being dominated by European rulers. This was the, one of the leaders of the Mau Mau Rebellion, which was a guerrilla, bloody battle that went on for quite a few years. He was captured and publicly executed in Nairobi, and now there's a statue to him. Um, but uh, Kenya got its independence in 1964, finally, in the general decolonization of all of Africa, which was one of the results of World War II. So this is the national symbol, the Harambe which means unity and diversity. And that's been a struggle for Kenya and the rest of Africa ever since because, again, the, the national lines were drawn somewhat arbitrarily. Many of these traditional people never were at peace or in union before. So this is the struggle of modern Africa. How do you, how do you get a nation state out of diverse people who often don't speak the same language other than English or Swahili? That's the second language of Kenya and spoken mostly on the coast because it was a com combined language 
uh, for trade that combined uh, Arabic, some Persian, some uh, Bantu phrases, English, and so Swahili is sort of a comparable to uh, uh, Malay uh, Bahasa, which is a com combined language that's shared by people for mostly commerce and not necessarily spoken by people at home. Anyway, the first president of Kenya was Jomo Kenyatta, who was a lawyer and one of the moderates who advised uh, some cooperation. And finally, when Kenya was given independence, he became the first president. And uh, capital moved to Nairobi rather than being down on the coast, like in Mombasa, just to try to have a central capital for the whole nation, including all these people in the uplands. Now, if you haven't been to Nairobi before, it's one of the dynamic capitals of uh, Africa now, a financial center, a cultural center, but uh, unusually it has a very large uh, national park right outside with a lot of wildlife right above the city. So it's probably the only major capital in the world that has uh, giraffe traffic jams. But it has the, the, the main government function, judiciary, legislature, uh, the tradition of the churches and universities, and so it's a comprehensive capital city. This is the media house, uh, and Kenya considered itself one of the most advanced and uh, develop, best developing countries in Africa, though that's uh, compared with other nearby countries that have been a complete disaster, like Uganda, Rwanda, uh, Somalia, and so they are considered a say more of an island of peace and cooperation mostly compared to the rest of their neighbors with particularly a growing economy. It's been growing from five to seven percent over the last decade. And the population has spread out from Nairobi and other town centers. Uh, back in 1900, it's estimated there were about three million population in Kenya. Now it's over 41 million. And that's an example of the population explosion that's happened all over Africa. And for whatever progress is being made, that is the underlying reality of the whole continent, along with much of the rest of the world. But it's a busy place, a modern place, and a lot of people are, let's say, detribalized. They're speaking English, Swahili, they came from a village, now they're living in a big city, driving around, having an office job. And then out in the countryside, there's a great extension of public health services, and to, to try to develop a, let's say, a more developed economy, whereas most of the people, some 70%, are still living in villages and working the land, matched by people who are advanced degrees in various things, and there's, a, there's an educated elite in Kenya in particular, um, which is comparable to other parts of Africa that are leading the way into a future that some are not being able to keep up with, let's say. Oh, here's a Nobel Prize-winning uh, author, Ngoyina Tiungo, who wrote an account of his village life through independence and then the troubles of modernization for the country. Other heroes of Kenya, this is uh, Rudisha, who won the Olympic 800-meter uh, sprint. And of course, sports is a big thing here. Here's one of the musicians uh, that's well known, uh, Chuakali. Um, and I played a little bit of African um, uh, Kenyan music when we started out. But we, if you have a chance, you can, if you're shopping, just go buy us number of CDs and see if you like them. If you don't like them, your, your grandkids will. Uh, in 2007, uh, there was a political opposition to the, uh, the rule of the party that was founded by um, uh, the Kenya, Kenya National Union of Kenyatta. And so there came to a point in many a democracy where it was the split vote, uh, nobody had a majority, there were demonstrations and some fighting, and this was in the news that over a thousand people died in all over the country fighting, and uh, finally the international community came and said, you cannot break up this growing economy and a democracy by fighting amongst yourselves. So under EU and international pressure, uh, the um, uh, President Mibaki joined with his counterpart in the opposition called the Orange Party, uh, Raida Odinga, to ha have a shared government. And that remains fairly much the um, political landscape of Kenya now where they took a highly centralized government and they uh, de de devolved some of the powers to the different provinces so that the ethnic conflicts which underlie the, the fighting at that particular time not recently ago or tried to be ameliorated by more of a confederation than what they call the big man politics of Africa where one party and one leader gets in charge and then they run it like a, their own personal kingdom. 
Now, the current president is Uhuru Kenyatta, who is the grandson of uh, Jomo Kenyatta. And uh, by the way, his fr first name means uh, freedom, and that's a word you'll see written and heard all around here. The biggest problem they're having now is the troubles in Somalia and then attacks by al-Shabaab and other terrorist groups in Kenya. Most famously, their massacre at, the, at a college and then the bombing of the Westgate Mall in Nairobi and continuing skirmishes, skirmishes up on the border. This led the Kenyan army and the African Union to actually lead the incursions into Somalia and to uh, destroy bases and hold the border and keep a lid on Somalia, which of course is a desperately poor and uh, conflicted country. And they have over 150,000 refugees from Somalia in Kenya now. Now this is the African Union, so this is one of the hopes for Africa that they will become a continent that can manage its own conflicts. Only a couple countries are not included in the Union, like Morocco is not. And so with outside assistance, they're training uh, their uh, security forces to try to hold back, particularly this terrible um, Islamist uh, terrorism that comes in right into downtown Nairobi, much less other parts of the world. So that's the trouble of our times, even in Kenya, though. Mombasa, I have not heard that there's any sec security problem. They just put in jail a British citizen for plotting to bomb things. Um, and they, they called him the White Spider because he was an uh, Englishman who had converted to Islam. And they caught him on a technical immigration issue and they put him into nine years in prison in Mombasa just last week. But meanwhile, Kenya is again uh, a country that's trying to look forward past even these current troubles with uh, more economic development. There are uh, explorations for oil and gas offshore, um, working with the Chinese Petroleum Company and uh, the Norwegian Company. And the general index of the health, the human development index of Kenya has gotten better over time. Uh, it was very poor when it had independence, so it has slowly been improving all of the things that make for a better economy and a better health for the people. Tea is the largest product along with cut flowers, curiously. So they fly those out to the tables of uh, Europe, or maybe this ship. And then many other products, um, but largely uh, agriculture. A lot of people are still on a subsistence level of working for maybe uh, 2 to $3 dollars U.S. A, uh, a day, and the average income is less than $2,000 a year for, for the rural people. And that uh, has been the subject of, a, of a, an advocate named Wangari Maatai, who was uh, a farmer woman in western Kenya who was educated, and then she started to advocate for the rights of the women farmers who do most of the work. The men go out traveling, driving, go into the city, and so often the women are left at home not only to raise the food but to raise the family. And uh, she won the, 19, uh, the 2004 Nobel Peace Prize for her, her advocacy, particularly of rural development and uh, reforestation. She started what's called the Green Belt Africa Movement, which continues on to this day as an Asian Development Bank plan to have all the villages and everybody go out and plant trees. And so far, they've planted a great swath in western Kenya going into Uganda, all to the Congo Basin. Uh, millions and millions of trees try to restore the forests that have been cut and provide livelihood and uh, sanctuary for wildlife. And I'm just going to read you a bit of her uh, writing because if you're interested in these issues, she's one of the more poignant writers about it, even though uh, her, um, her husband divorced her for talking too much. And then she, she, in her protest, the judge put her in jail for talking too much. Now, let that be a lesson to you. But here, uh, she writes uh, in this book, With, without the mirror of the natural world that the natural world presents to us, we will no longer see ourselves, and we will forget who we are. This is why our work in reclamation and reforesting, bringing back what is essential so we can move forward, planting trees, speaking our languages, telling our stories, and not dismissing the lives of our ancestors are all part of the same act of conservation, all constituent elements in the broader ecosystem on which human life depends. We need to protect our local foods, remember how to grow and cook them, serve and eat them, we must remember how to make our clothes and wear them with pride. We need to recall our mother tongues and literally mind our language. Let us practice our spirituality, dance our dances, revivify our symbols, and rediscover our communal character. 
Africans must make a deliberate choice to move forward together toward a more compre comprehensive and cohesive macro nations where all can feel secure, free, and at peace with themselves and others, where there's no need for any group to organize violence against their neighbors. Then everyone will begin to reap the benefits of unity in diversity. Well, she was predicted to become the uh, leader of Kenya, the prime minister in time, president, uh, but unfortunately she died early of cancer, so her legacy goes on with many other people following in her steps, particularly out in the countryside where the bulk of the people are and the, and the economy is, and so she sort of single-handedly in, encouraged particularly many women to stand up for their rights and not be quiet. Uh, uh, do, I, do I hear anything? Oh, okay. Anyway, the, uh, you know, the efforts in Africa are, are difficult just because of the variety of people and the extent of the land and the need for education above all. Of course, that's uh, primary uh, around the world, but especially in Africa where there's still high rates of illiteracy. Even back in the far countryside, you have these towns developed that are sort of on the cusp of development. This is up near Mount uh, Kenya, which is the highest mountain in, in Kenya near Kilimanjaro. And a lot of the upland is now tea plantations and intensive agriculture and at the conflict with the wildlife. So the reason to come here is actually to go out and see these places, not just stay on the coast here. So those of you who are flying out or going to the nearby game reserves, this is the great experience of Kenya and Africa and Tanzania, this whole, particularly East Africa, where the greatest migratory herds are. Um, still, there's some elephants. Unfortunately, they are being poached down to a fraction of what they were in, uh, since independence. You can read all about that, but I'm just going to go through a little bit of it. The lions, for instance, are considered almost endangered in East Africa because, again, they're, um, they're, the human pressure on them has destroyed a lot of their habitat or else they're hunted to stay away from the villages. So we're, we're looking at, in our time, the extinction of some key specimens and species uh, here's a leopard, cheetah, the, the, their numbers have all crashed in recent decades. A lot of it due to agriculture, they get pesticides and other poisoning or else their own uh, prey is gone. Here's a curious one, the katakola, I don't know if you've ever seen this. It's a small kind of a lynx, but it has uh, very large hind legs and it can jump up, uh, up almost 10 feet in the air to catch a flying bird. Uh, here's a wild cat. It looks like, like your basic tabby cat, but this uh, preys on all kinds of rodents and birds also. Then here's the Pratas monkey. Now, th these are often in game reserves, so what's happened is that they've been, like some of the ones we're visiting in the next few days, um, there's been an agreement that certain part of land is set, off for, set aside for agriculture as long as a certain part is kept as a game preserve, and then the locals have some either tourist economy or else innate appreciation that they should save at least some of these great animals. Here's a black and white colobus. And then the wildebeest. Now, <clears throat> from Kenya and uh, into Tanzania on the Serengeti Plain, that's the greatest display of migratory animals on Earth, and perhaps you've been there or will get to go there. Um, but up to a million of them will cross the rivers and go foraging in the great extensive Central Valley Plains uh, of Kenya and Tanzania. Here's a Thompson's gazelle and zebras. Now the real question is, why do they have those stripes? Well, it said so they can find their soulmate. They can, no two are alike. If you look at them long enough, they all look like individuals. But what's the old story? What's black and white and red all over? A zebra with a sunburn. Then the, the, the giraffes, they're, they're sort of the lords of the, of the Serengeti and all these great places, but uh, curiously they have no predators because they're so high they, um, uh, they can just see what's coming and then they're so tall that they can kick anything away. Only uh, female lions are capable of taking them down, but that's only when they've run out of other game. And here's a charming one. I'm sure you'd like one for home. That's a warthog, which are very dangerous because they are a man-eater also. And then the rhino, again almost down to the last of them just in the, in, the, in the hundreds. And I was at a park a couple of, uh, know, just last year, and uh, they were down to the last four. They used to have 50 within 
the last decades. But again, they're being poached for their horns to sell as a medicine in Asia. And then the bird life, There's a, particularly out in the Serengeti area and the other national parks are vast, uh, in the lake lands of the, these giant lakes that are out across in the west, lots of flamingos. Here's a secretary bird which uh, lives exclusively on snakes. You can sort of see it in his eyes. And lots of beautiful butterflies, and this is called a map butterfly, but uh, I'll leave the wildlife to your own uh, discovery out there, and I'm not a zoologist to say anything of it, but except this is the magic of the land. And the local people will appreciate it too, but again, the conflict between the growing human needs and the diminishing wilderness are the story of most of Africa. Now, we'll be in Mombasa, which is this natural harbor of an island surrounded by the estuaries of a couple of uh, lakes. And it had been, as I said, started originally by Persian and then Arab traders um, who came to trade with the inland and sent it back elsewhere. So both Mombasa and Zanzibar and uh, Dar es Salaam are very mixed uh, communities. Uh, when the Portuguese came for 1498 with Vasco da Gama and then returned to build a fort 1505, they conquered the city rather than just being trading partners and built the Fort Jesus, which we'll see in Mombasa a couple of days. This became the stronghold of East Africa for the Portuguese Empire. And you can see this old chart that the city is on an island surrounded by water, so it's the perfect natural harbor. It's all built up today and then has a broad industrial port and other industries around it, so it's not a small town by any means. Over a million people just on the island. Uh, but we'll be docking on the, on the, on the, uh, uh, the, the, what is the south side of the island. And then you go into the city. It's not all that attractive because it is so big and new and commercial at this point. And these are the, the tusks on um, Moy Avenue, the center artery through the main city. And it is a uh, noisy, jumbly African city. Not as big as, uh, other ones in Africa, but uh, it's because it's on the sea, it has fairly fresh air, and it's hot though, it's tropical and hot. Here's the central market, which is full of all kinds of things from the uplands. Uh, and the, this is the, uh, one of the many cities down the coast that are the heart of the Swahili culture. Again, Swahili is a complete mix of people, and they say only maybe 5% of, of people speak Swahili at home because it's a kind of a patois that's been developed for the trading on this whole coast up and down. And so it is um, the national language partly, and everybody speaks a little bit of it, but uh, it's, uh, it's not it itself a pure culture by any means. It's uh, the ultimate expression of the Indian Ocean of all the traders and all the people who've come here. Well, just down the way, and again across this sort of an artificial border drawn long ago is Tanzania. Uh, it used to be called Tanganyika, which meant, uh, uh, literally in Swahili, it meant uh, the, the sails on the wilderness, meaning a trading post to the interior. And then when uh, the independence of Tanzania happened, they merged Zanzibar with Tanganyika, and they changed the name to Tanzania. And so that's the uh, uh, heritage that is there to, uh, now with, again, a new nation that's had its struggles to try to unify what is a very different coastal culture with the great interior. And along with uh, Kenya, this is again a vast land with, above all, many um, natural parks and great game. Like I believe people are going off to the Salus Game Reserve and others might go further out to the Serengeti or Nyongoro uh, Crater or even maybe some of you have climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, which is the highest mountain in all of Africa, at a, almost 6,000 meters high. Um, but again, like Kenya, it was very localized and many different kinds of people, um, not as populated, it's only about half the population of Kenya, again grown tremendously in recent years, but uh, its uh, commercial center is Dar es Salaam, which in Arabic means the place of peace, again a trading port going back a thousand or more years, and Zanzibar, which had been part of the Omani uh, nation. Uh, since the 1840. Now this is the area where, again, it uh, has a, a, a difficult history. This is when the British and the Germans tried to cooperate uh, at the beginning of World War I, which did not work out very well. <clears throat> but uh, uh, it, 
at the uh, League of Nations in uh, 1919, Tan Tanganyika was yielded as a British protectorate. And so it became um, a British protectorate through until its independence. This is the former president, uh, Mugufili, who was able to keep unity. There was not so much division in uh, Tanganyika or Tan Tanzania like there has been in Kenya. And it also has not had any uh, conflict between its uh, large Muslim population on the coast and its largely Christian or animist population in the interior. So after we're in Zanzibar, we'll be going to Dar es Salaam, which is a, again has its modern side, and then it has an old town uh, right on the coast and uh, a very walkable area, actually. Um, and then, uh, then again, a large commercial city that is uh, growing up into the uh, hinterland. Here's one of the mosques, the Qaddafi Mosque. It was actually sponsored by the Libyan Qaddafi. An old Lutheran church, Azania. That name Azania is actually refers to the whole Swahili coast, which in itself means the coast. And again, a developing country with uh, trying to develop its human resources above all. Here's the university and uh, uh, the University of Dar es Salaam with a kind of a uh, interior architecture, or rather a, a, a architecture that tries to be African like some of the housing and buildings of the Bantu people. Uh, Tanzania is very poor, more poor than uh, Kenya, but one thing it does have, it has diamonds and gold. And so this is one of their resources that are being developed. This is the Williamson Company mine uh, in the Midlands. And again, a vast interior. Uh, I'll leave it again for our visit to go see it uphand, but uh, between these two countries you have such a tremendous uh, uh, expression of wildlife. Here's part of the migration where the wildebeest are trying to cross the uh, Gambesi River followed by the uh, zebras to go f foraging. They, they essentially go north and south depending on the rainy season. And here's Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, I was reading the comments of one of the local guides. He climbed it 500 times in his life, all at a sprint. And it's a very gentle mountain, so you don't need any uh, technical equipment or ropes. There's no cliffs to, to uh, get in your way. And then you can go all the way to the top. And this has been a concern recently because this snowfall has been less and less every year, and that means the rivers are drying out. And it is the water source for much of the Serengeti and the other vast areas below and all the wildlife. Then on the western end of Tanzania is this great lake, Lake Tanganyika, which is the world's longest freshwater lake, 680 kilometers, and it's over 1,400 meters deep. That's only only Lake Baikal in Russia is actually deeper. So this is a, the whole lake system that is essentially valleys of the Great Rift that have filled up with water are uh, another world in themselves. And you can go out there and live in villages and go on boats all around. Uh, these are the local people on the um, eastern shore of the lake, the Hadza, who are still um, nomadic hunters and gatherers. They have never so settled in permanent villages. So they're a very small population, but they're completely the other end of the country from Dar es Salaam. This is the Nyogogoro uh, crater, which is the world's largest dry crater. It's over 19 kilometers wide, and it has a little bit of water in the center, but it's a basin that's full of wildlife, and again, a national park. Now, I'm going to come back to Zanzibar, which is where we go from Mombasa before we go to Dar es Salaam. And this is a the former uh, uh, island sultanate of these two islands, uh, uh, Unguja and uh, Pemba. And uh, Zanzibar City is on the west coast of uh, Unguja Island, which has some forests and remnant uh, wildlife on it. Pemba was largely converted into spice plantations. And it was an independent place until uh, a British protectorate recently, until it joined with the larger nation of Tanzania, and it, it still considers itself certainly like an island a bit, a bit apart. It's um, somewhat like the Maldives. You have these low-lying islands and lots of lagoons and beautiful seas and coral reefs, and so it's become a tourist destination. But traditionally, it was just trading. These dhows would go along the coastwise all the way up to Arabia and come back depending on the monsoon se season. And uh, they're still there, and uh, let's say this real hands-on sailing uh, with the traditional wooden craft that are still being built. We, we have the offering to go out on a Tao a couple of times in the day and one in the evening. It's become a 
popular thing to do, of course. But, but the heart of Zanzibar City is the Stone Town, which is called that because it, it had a city wall and, a, and uh, masonry buildings, and most of it's still there, though it's had a whole modern city built outside of it. So again, it's a, a World Heritage Site with uh, modern conveniences and resorts, things like this. But uh, this is a, probably one of those places when you were a kid heard about, oh, well, let's go to Zanzibar. Did you ever think you'd go there? Well, here we're going, but uh, uh, this is a view of the harem and the uh, harbor tower, which are still there, matched by mosques and a great Anglican church. But Zanzibar was most famous for its spice trade and then its slave trade. It said that about four million interior Africans were captured and brought out via Zanzibar and sold to Arabia and other places. This was not the export site for the slaves that went to the Americas, but it was a very um, cruel place in its former commerce. This is the old uh, fort uh, that used to be guarding the slave market. Uh, in 1838, the Omani came and took possession of the, these islands under Sultan Majid bin Said. Now, this is the same family that are still in ruling in Oman today, but uh, they thought the African trade was so important that they moved their capital and their palace to Zanzibar. And uh, this was after the Portuguese had been um, chased out by other local kingdoms and they invited the Omanis to be their rulers to help boost trade. Now this is a, a kind of a painful story, but this uh, Omani prince, Tipu Tip, was the most famous uh, slave trader of the era, 1840 to 1880 about, and he had an army of some 10,000 that would go on raids all into interior Africa, come back with all these trains of people, and then, uh, ironically, he himself was the grandson of a slave, but he, in the family business, went back into it. Now then the British, of course, banned slavery and then sent the Royal Navy to try to suppress all of this, but it went on um, until, well, maybe it still goes on a bit today, but this is the memorial for the slave trade that's right in, in the Stone City right next to the Anglican Cathedral, a very uh, sad-looking monument to the millions who came through. And when the British had finally suppressed all of the slave trade, uh, the Anglican Cathedral was built right over the slave market, which is quite an quite a edifice, and it's built right over the chambers where they used to hold the thousands and thousands of slaves. There was also, there's also there's an excursion out to Prison Island, which is another one of these prisons for the slaves. And they have this in West Africa too, but it's a grim reminder of how cruel people could be. Well, when, when the slave trade was finally abolished, um, Zanzibar returned to being a, a spice exporting place, uh, ivory from the mainland, other commodities. And, and it hasn't really changed so much. It has never been bulldozed and modernized. The last time uh, they had any conflict uh, was when one of the Omani sultans who um, was anti-British, um, uh, in his succession, he said he's not going to obey the anti-slavering laws. And so the Royal Navy came in and dropped anchor and bombarded his palace, which is right, right around in here. And they called it off after 38 minutes, and the Sultan uh, submitted. And it's in, said to be the world's shortest war. Um, but the palace is still there, and then the, the dock, and it's not a big industrial center like it is in Mombasa or Dar es Salaam, but uh, when, when we dock there, you can walk into town and see uh, the narrow streets, and the, this is the palace on the left, and the, the building on the right is uh, former government offices. Now, now it's the National Museum called the House of Wonders because it has a lot of the historical displays of Zanzibar. And uh, the Stone City is also a World Heritage Site that's preserved uh, with these beautiful Arabic and mm, some African uh, Swahili style architecture, particularly these uh, houses that have um, porches and louvered wit large windows so uh, there's a bit of a natural air conditioning in what is otherwise a very hot and sticky climate. And then there's all the different people. The city's about half Muslim and half mainland, let's say Bantus and other people of Tanzania. And they're all getting along fairly well. There's been some electoral problems, but it's a fairly peaceful city and has not had any security problems recently. 
And again, the cloves was the major um, spice grown on the, the two different islands and then processed. And so the people are there uh, um, without slavery in the way, let's say, cooperating. Now here's a, they have every year a, the Zanzibar Film Festival, which you might, can, if you can read it, it says the, the festival of the Dao countries. Now that implies the cultural interest from Zanzibar, even down to Mozambique, up to Oman and the Persian Gulf and the larger Indian Ocean communities. And then this fellow is also included. He's the red colobus monkey, which is endemic, only found in uh, the um, uh, Jobari uh, Forest Reserve to the uh, east of the city of Zanzibar, Stone City. And then there's a vast world of the shallow seas here. Here's somebody's house on a rock outcrop where they grow uh, red algae for medicinal purposes and other purposes. So the people have adapted to have other industry, but above all, they have uh, beautiful resorts over on, again, on the ocean side from Zanzibar with uh, beautiful beaches. And again, uh, when all the world is in a problem, I recommend uh, just going for a nice sail, which I hope we'll get to do. So this whole area of Africa is uh, sort of intriguing because it is highly contrasted with one area on the sea than the uplands and the snow-capped peaks, not too far away, but not very close. So I hope we appreciate the sort of cultural uh, experience of this part of Africa, and once you've seen some of Africa, you're always wanting to see more, and that's what we'll be doing on our cruise. Anyway, thank you very much, and I'll see you.